Welcome back to Snow the Goalie, the only Flyers podcast. I'm Russ Joy, at Joy on Broad, joined as always by the fantastic and the absolutely excited for the start of Flyers season, Anthony Sanfilippo, you can find on Twitter at AntSanPhilly. Anthony, we uh, we were together at Flyers Skate Zone over the weekend. We have uh, a few news and notes to uh, pass along to the fine folks of the uh, Delaware Valley, and of course, uh, a, another edition of Who's That Flyer, as well as uh, some questions from Twitter. So, Anthony, how's it going? It's going great, Russ. It's you know again. I I like when we record at humane hours, and right now um, it's Wednesday, and it's only twenty minutes past nine, which is a normal time for people to be awake and and having a conversation, as opposed to either the crack of dawn or you know uh, the witching hour, uh, in which case I'm either falling asleep or haven't quite woken up yet. But so. Um, it's good to actually speak to you at a reasonable time, and we've done this a couple times now. So I'm, I'm starting to think that you're uh, taking this a little bit more seriously and taking me into consideration a little bit more, and I appreciate that. I have so much love and respect for you. I can't believe you would have ever questioned that, <laughs> Anthony. This isn't like The uh, Bachelor in Paradise, okay? This is, you, uh, you, you watch that show, don't you? I, I did. It was a, uh, a very that's guilty path- pleasure. That's pathetic. And my wife didn't understand why I was watching it. I'm like, I don't know. I just get sucked into the bad drama. I actually think if I could, I would just watch the drama. This is like the problem. When I was young, I was a big pro wrestling fan. Yeah. And uh, Goldberg came back like a year and a half ago, if anybody knows who Goldberg is. And so it kind of sucked me back in. And he's been gone for a year and a half, and I'm still here. But when I was a kid, I would only ever want to watch the wrestling, and I would skip through Uh, I would like tape everything on the old VCR and I would skip through all the stuff on the mic, which was bad because like back in those days, like that was stone cold and the rock. And now all I really do is watch the, uh, the, the stuff on the mic so I can get an idea of how the, the storylines are progressing. It is really soap opera for men. Anyway, bachelor in paradise, it's over. And, uh, yeah, anyway, don't ever question my, my faith or my loyalty to you, Anthony. Uh, we had, I I would say that on Saturday we had a, a pretty good moment. Uh, as we walked around Skate Zone, seeing fans out filling uh, Skate Zone. Now it's the first time that I've I've been to an event like that uh, down in Voorhees with the public. Uh, I don't know how that ranks uh, with the, you know the normal kind of public access, but it looked like a lot of people kind of filling in for that that second skate that we were uh, able to make. And it certainly you know the the anticipation in the air was palpable. So it was it was pretty cool to see. Yeah, no, it was fun. It, it's all it's always fun um, when you're there at the start of camp, especially that first weekend. You know, the Flyers do a real nice job. They they uh, with their um, marketing department and getting uh, getting people out there and having like a lot of fun events for the kids and things to do and you know sign up for this or you know sales sales in the uh, fan whatever it's called fan gear store and they can buy your jerseys and you know the latest uh, par- uh, apparel. Um, and then, uh, and then you get to watch them practice, and the practices are long because at that time they're doing, they're doing two practices, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and you know they're running about ninety minutes long. Uh, usually, a practice lasts less than an hour, and this one's running, you know, hour and a half, almost two in some instances. And you know, you really get to see a lot of the a lot of the players, not just you know the the the, the team, you know, players are going to be on the team who you root for night in night out, but you also get to see the prospects. You see some of the young kids come up and. You know, I think we got to see uh, while we were there uh, talking with uh, Timmy Saunders and Billy Clement. Um, I think there was a, a really awesome goal by uh, Morgan Frost, uh, and yeah, he got sent back to junior, uh, which is not a surprise. Um, but it was really nice to just see, you know, see what the ability is that this kid has, and you sit there and say, "Wow, okay, now I see why." You know, they, you know, that's something that you a reason you know they drafted him as high as they did, and why they're high on him, and why they think that he'll be a player in a couple of years. Um, so you get to see those things, you know, up close and personal, and uh, that makes for uh, that makes for a good time. It's different than the regular season practices because regular season practices, it's a lot more systematic stuff. You know, you don't get to see the really really flash their uh, skills and abilities uh, on display. But here in training camp. They're doing compete drills, which is a lot of fun to watch because it's it's like game action, even if it's only for you know ten fifteen second bursts. You know they'll dump the puck in the corner two on two, and you got to go fish it out and find your teammate and blah, blah blah. And they make a little competition of it, and it's it's fun. So you know you get to watch that, and you get to see it right there up close. And for a lot of those fans, Russ. You know a lot of fans get to go to practice because you know it's free, it's open. You know you get to see the players up close. 
they don't they don't necessarily have the you know the the means or the wherewithal to actually buy tickets because it's expensive to go to a, a, a regular season game. So that's kind of like their their real chance to actually see the team that they root for on television every night. And so the, for the, for the Flyers to put together the kind of event that they do uh, that first weekend of training camp is really kind of cool and, and really kind of shows that they care about the whole fan base and not just the the ones who actually come in and buy the tickets. Not just the top percent of the top one percent of the top one percent. Yeah, yeah, and the thing. I mean, look, look. Don't don't get me wrong. They they cater to their season ticket holders in, in ways that you know the regular fan don't, doesn't have an opportunity to. They have events during the year where the players you know go to these season ticket holder only events. Uh, you have like dinner with them, or you get autographs and pictures, and spend a little bit more time with the players and the team than you would if you were just you know Joe fan buying two tickets off a of StubHub to sit up in the you know the nosebleed seats. Um, so there are, I mean, there there is a um, class system in a lot of ways, but. It's fair to say that the Flyers, maybe more so than any team, um, and I don't want to knock the other teams because I'm not, because you know every team does something and does their own thing and makes their time available to everybody free. But it's you know you can't go to Eagles practice every day. They have the ones that are open to the public, you know, and they fill the link, and that's really cool. But you can't go to Eagles practice every day. You can't go to Sixers practice every day. You can't when I mean, the Phillies don't really practice in season, but. Um, even when you're down in spring training, you can't get into the into uh, the ballpark unless there's a game going on. Um, the Flyers let their practices be made available to the public and say, "Okay, hey, come. You know what? You can't come to a game. Come watch us practice." And I think that that's a cool thing. And I think that that's a really um, you know, and, and it's interesting. Like the reason that these other practices are all closed, and I'm not, I'm going to take baseball out of it because there's really no, like I said, no practicing during the season. And nobody wants to watch it because it's a boring dying sport. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but football, but football and basketball. I mean, they close their practices because oh, it's you know, it's top secret. Right, what they're unless, doing. Uh, unless What's Bill going Belichick on? has sent yeah. a uh, janitor with a camera. It's, it's yeah. top secret, right? Can yeah. I can't see? I mean, you know, to be fair, I mean, I guess that's what they're doing in hockey. They're they're installing their systems and they're you know looking at the team that they're about to play the next night and you know here's how they play a certain way. So we're going to do this, try and do this a little bit differently to take advantage of their weaknesses and stuff. I mean, it's done right there in front of in view of everybody. And so you know, if you're the New Jersey Devils and you're playing the Flyers the next night. How hard is it to send, you know, a scout dressed as a as a fan to go down, you know, down, down the turnpike and sit in on practice and watch what the heck they're doing for, for an hour, right? I mean, you could do that, and it, and nobody nobody cares, nobody says anything, and that's that's the way it should be, you know. That's the it's it should be available to the people, and that's so I'm really kind of uh, I know I'm you know going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but I I really like the fact that hockey pr- practices are made available to the the fans all across the league. It's not just the Flyers, but all across the league. I think it's a, a thing that the that the NHL does really well. Um, and I'm not one to always give the NHL props, but because I think that the league has its fair share of problems. But uh, this is certainly not one of them. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, going on little tangents here is, is kind of what makes Snow Goalie the uh, the best Flyers podcast out there, right? Um Look, there, there. I think was one really cool uh, part of this, and I don't want to sound like a fanboy. You know, when I was thinking about the uh, the mention that you made of of the season ticket only events, there was one that I remember going to in college. A friend of mine, uh, I guess his family had season tickets, so we went to one, and I met Dan Carcillo, uh, and and Carcillo was was pretty funny. But Mike Richards, there was a, a moment where they had given out these posters as we were going in, and what I really wanted was my uh, my Mike Richards jersey to get signed. And they handed me this poster, and like some people had, I guess, gotten other memorabilia signed. I put down the poster just like to let it rest, uh, so I could grab the jersey. And he signed the poster, and I went, "Oh no!" And I went to hand the jersey, and this like bouncer security guard with Richards was like, "Only one thing per person." I'm like, "Oh my god, oh, I didn't want the." And then Richards like, "It's totally fine." And Richards just goes, signs it, good picture, like it was nice. So, yeah, I mean, I think those kind of things, like, those are lasting memories. So, you know, if you can get down there, if, you know, whether it's something like that where it's, you know, for people who can afford season tickets or, you know, can take a friend along uh, or going down to Voorhees and getting to see the team up close and personal, I mean, unless you, you know, are able to afford, I, I don't know, I'm trying to remember the, the cheapest lower level seats I think I've ever had were 75 bucks. I think it was like 2009 the Flyers played the Penguins early in the season, 
and like an hour before game time, my room, my college roommate and I at, at the time uh, went down there and last second bought StubHub tickets for it. It was like 75 bucks. We were like five rows off the ice or something like that. And that, the I think the one thing, if you've never been out to a hockey game before, is you don't really get a, a real feel for how fast the game is played, nor do I think you get a real idea of how big these guys are. Like when, when you're down at Voorhees, and you just kind of overhear conversations people are having. Like, we know Nolan Patrick is big. We know that he looks big on skates on TV. But he is he's quite a, an imposing presence. And you just think about as he fills in, you know, over the course of his career, you know, he's going to be a frightening force uh, coming down down the ice at full speed. There are just things that I, I think you kind of lose in, in the way that uh, the game is presented on TV. And it's something that you and I had actually talked about, I think, on the way down to Voorhees on the way back, the way that that the camera angles are done uh, versus the way that you think that they should be done, more of you know the way that like the the NHL, uh, it's really what are they just NHL 19 I guess the EA Sports NHL games are where it's kind of a, a bird's eye view, the overhead view of uh, being a better way to watch hockey than you know necessarily the the sideline camera kind of thing that you get in basketball and and football. So I don't know. Do you want to elaborate on why you think the bird's eye view is is a better way to watch hockey? Well, I mean, go into any arena um, in the league and ask where the GMs and the scouts sit. They all sit up top. <laughs> Nobody's sitting down by the glass. You know, Major League Baseball scouts are sitting behind home plate, right? In, in seats that could be purchased by, you know, the, the general public. But that's where the scouts are sitting. Um, and, you know, in, in football, the press box is mostly in most stadiums kind of mid-level in the stadium. There's a couple of stadiums where you're way up top. But most of them are mid-level. Uh, same thing with baseball. Most of them are mid, you know, uh, uh, mid-level. And, and basketball, um, you know, you're down on the floor, right? You're right down there. And that's where, that's where the scouts are watching games from too. Not hockey. Hockey, you sit all the way up. The higher you are, the better the the better it is to see the sport. Um, yeah, it's cool to be down there on the glass and banging on the glass and watching the players like right up front, and you get to see the speed of the game. But once you get past it, once you once you've experienced that a couple times, it, it kind of is not you know it's not as exciting. But as you watch the game from up top, you can see everything developing. Like you can see the systems that the teams are playing. You can see. Um, how a def- how a team defensively is trying to take away a certain player or, or a certain portion of the ice, um, and you could see when a uh, uh, a mistake happens, and oh no, that's going to lead to an odd man rush, and then like three seconds later, lo and behold, there's the odd man rush. Like you could you can it, you could be prescient almost. You can you could see it developing, and it's kind of cool to watch it from there. And I always thought that the video games. Um, uh, the reason why people like playing the video games is because you can play the game the way it should be seen, <laughs> and that's from above, and, and just kind of ha- watch it as it goes that way. Um, and watching it, you know, uh, horizontally as opposed to vertically, you lose the puck. You don't see, you know, what's happening on the near side of the ice where where the camera is. Um, you really can't see how a team's playing defense or how their breakout is happening or or anything else. And yeah, of course, there's all the cameras in the boards now and in the net, and you know sometimes the goalie's wearing a, a GoPro of some kind in like the All Star game or whatever. Um, and you get to see kind of neat little other angles, and that's all well and good. But the the fact of the matter is, is the game would be so much better on television, and people would be able to follow it so much better. As a casual fan, obviously the hardcore fan can watch it from any angle and know what's going on. But the casual fan would really enjoy hockey more if they got an opportunity to watch it from from above the ice, over the ice, and watch the plays develop. And I think that that, I mean, it's kind of hard to do because uh, you really can't fly a, a camera because the puck, you know, come, does go up into the air and stuff like that, and. Um, so you really can't fly a camera around the around the rink, but you can get close. I mean, you can put one on obviously on top of the glass. You could put them on the scoreboard, um, and really, really kind of if you you know sync them up digitally, you can actually kind of create almost like a three hundred and sixty degree um, camera angle that's above the heads of the players. And I, I think that that would be 
ultimately the best way to go. I just think that they're, you know, the networks, while they don't mind doing it for replays and stuff, I think they're wary of such a drastic change that would throw off the viewing audience. And I and I get it. I understand. It would be you know. kind of like um, uh, it was was it CBS or yeah, I think it was CBS last year, um, in their coverage. Uh, or no, no, it was NBC on their Thursday night football games. Uh, early in this in the NFL season, they actually did kind of like the Madden cam, um, you know, lining up behind the quarterback. Yeah, and kind of doing it that way, almost like a like a zoomed in all twenty two film. Um, I think it would be interesting, like maybe on rivalry night. Uh, like nothing like a, a Wednesday night game to kind of experiment. I think Sundays, Sundays are kind of the ones that I get the most excited for. Um, pretty much any time Doc is on the call, that's the uh, the time I get the most excited. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind, especially on some of these Wednesday night rivalry games that aren't really rivalries or aren't or don't really hold much, uh, you know, much draw power, drawing power. Uh, I, I wouldn't be opposed to seeing them kind of experiment with this. I, I would also kind of argue that you know because of the way that nbc has things set up especially on their mobile platform on the nbc sports app and i think about the way that they do epl coverage uh they they certainly could have a secondary stream running at the same time using a different camera and trying to elicit feedback from viewers on if they like the incorporation of of that other camera angle perhaps they can even include you know a secondary broadcast team that's maybe a little bit more analytics based or you know something something to that effect i think that that's something as as we kind of move forward in the future of of hockey and and how to make hockey a you know a, a, a even more engaging sport to a general public you know things that include analytics or things that include you know as sports gambling becomes legalized across the country you know maybe that's that's something that nbc and and company begin to start to embrace and kind of run as a you know a secondary stream certainly wouldn't hurt no, it's not. It's not a bad idea, and I, I think a, a way to really test the angle that I'm suggesting is the outdoor games because you can you can fly the camera outside. You know, you can actually put it up uh, above the the point where um, the, you know, the puck will go, and there is no center hung scoreboard hanging down from the middle of the roof over center ice. So you can actually fly those cameras. They and do have it. though, haven't they? They, they, they have, usually have. Yeah, it's they have like a it. like a little drone or something that yeah. they they have sitting out in sure. Um, around center ice yeah they have it but that doesn't necessarily mean they're showing you the whole game that way i mean it, it's okay. like it wanna, it's being used as a cut to as opposed to being a a primary camera if it was a primary camera i think that that's what I, that's what i'm suggesting i'm suggesting it that the game be watched that way you know what i'm saying as it's happening not in replay not as a oh let's quickly cut to this and then we'll get into the one that's in the zone kind of thing i'm t- i'm saying 80 percent of the game be shown from above and see how it works and see what people think. I, I certainly think it will play. I really do. I think you see so much more of the, of the sport that you never see watching a game, you know, going left to right across your screen. It, it, you just don't. You lose so much. And I, I, I really wish a network would give it a shot. I agree. Especially, you know, even when we were down in Voorhees, like um, when we were watching at ice level after we kind of went over uh, partway through the, the morning, we went over to – where the wings were, uh, which we'll get back to in a second, uh, why we were there and, and who on the team is the most interested, I think, in the wings. Um, but we went over to go interview a couple of the wings players, and that thing will be going up on uh, on the website on Crossing Broad later this week. I uh, just haven't gotten to transcribing those uh, interviews yet. But, you know, watching it at ice level and then going up to kind of like the uh, like the press overhang, which was really funny. Uh, <laughs> the press is on one overhang. And then the front office and team personnel are over on this uh, separate overhang, uh, overlooking the ice. And now it's the uh, the banner photo on my uh, um, my Twitter profile. Kind of gives you a better, I think, a better idea, a better um, view of of what it looks like from up there. And again, like when you're there and you're able to take in the entirety of the ice and watch plays develop, uh, I think it was the tic tac toe play that I think it was Morgan Frost had buried. And then there was one that um. Carter Hart, or was it Hart had the stick save on, uh, uh, who was it now? Uh, I don't remember now. I'll have to go back in my Twitter timeline. But there was this like beautiful play that you could see from a mile away was getting set up where it was going to be tic-tac-toe behind the net, uh, real quick touch pass out front, and it was buried. Um, there were just some really good things going on in practice, but like being able to see an entire play develop, you're right. Like you 
just simply cannot get that from the way that the uh, the TV angles are, are currently worked. So I don't know. Thoughts for uh, for NBC. I know they're listening. So uh, so let's get this thing going. Uh, news and notes from uh, from Saturday at Voorhees. I think the the one thing that stood out. Uh, we caught up with Scott Lawton uh, right after the uh, the first session, and right before the second session was set to begin. And there was a position change that had been discussed, and it was something that we've seen a little bit in games, but we've certainly seen out at practice of Scott Lawton making a move to the wing. Can you speak to you know why this change may have been made, and and you know we'll get to the penalty kill in a little bit, but like the idea of you know when we've been talking about who's going to take that three C spot. Now we're talking about taking a guy who, you know, very well could have been competing for that three C spot, potentially putting him out on the wing. Yeah. I I'm a little, I'm a little perplexed by this. I mean, I'm not completely perplexed by it because Lawton did play some wing last year, even in the playoffs, he played on the wing uh, against the penguins. Um, So it's not like it's a new thing for him. Um, But I am a little perplexed that, you know, it's it's they would they want to see Jordan wheel more as a center, and Lawton more on the wing. I, I look, it's it, the way I see it is I, I guess the decision is this: Lawton's a, a little bit more of a bigger body, um, and when you play the wing, you don't skate as much, right? You don't have to you don't have to cover as much ice, um, but you're obviously going to be in more. Um, you know, one-on-one, two-on-two battles on the wall. So it's going to be a harder game um, than it is when you're a center. And I think Wheel kind of got swallowed up there a lot last year, and, you know, that's kind of why he disappeared for significant chunks of the season. Um, And I think that their thought process is, well, we think Jordan Wheel's got a little bit of ability and he can make stuff happen, but we got to get him off the wall. So let's put him in the middle of the ice. And, well, if we do that, then we got to move somebody out to the wing um who's you know who's better to put out there and i think that they look at it and say well probably lawton because you know he he can play a little bit more of that a little bit more physical style can kind of won't get worn down from it uh as easily as perhaps jordan wheel did so that was an interesting thing to me that you know um and and scotty said that you know he had a conversation with hack um, and, and that's something that they wanted to try and do on a more regular basis. Now, it doesn't mean he's not going to play some center. As a matter of fact, I think um, as the game, the preseason game is going on, on uh, in Madison Square Garden tonight, as we're recording this, uh, I think Scotty's playing in the middle uh, with uh, uh, Oscar Lindblom. He's Lind got Lindblom and um, uh, uh, Corbin Knight. Yeah, Corbin Knight on, on, those, on his line. So I think he's playing in the middle there. Um, but, uh, and they did say, I mean, Haxtell did say he wanted to get him at least one preseason game playing center, uh, if not more. So, and, and interestingly enough, he's playing center and he's got three points tonight, three assists <laughs> playing center. He's probably, it's probably a more natural position for him. Right. Um, was, but, uh, but I get it. I mean, I kind of understand it, but boy, Jordan wheel does not excite me as a third line center. He really doesn't. And, and that's the thing that. That makes me a little cringe a little bit because I think that that's an experiment that they're going to go with that they're going to try, and I'm not certain that it's going to be really that beneficial because especially when you're on especially when they're on the road, I think that the the opposition is going to try and match up and get their best players out there with Jordan Wheel at center, and now you got to suddenly going to see you know you're going to play a game in Pittsburgh and Jordan Wheel is going to be on there on the ice at the same time as Crosby, you know. Uh, I I don't know. Fair matchup. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I don't see it. I just like, don't. I, pretty I don't much understand. Like at that point, I think. Yeah, right. The, now the one thing I do, th- I, the one player that I really like um, so far in, in uh, training camp and and the preseason, um, a guy who's played uh, three games prior Can to I the guess? Rest, I think he's back in the lineup again. Go ahead. Vorobiev. Yeah, yeah. Michael Vorobiev is really really looked good as a two-way player. And that's kind of more what you want out of a third-line center. So I really wouldn't be surprised if Vorobiev doesn't make this team, you know, or at least gets a, a real long look over the final you know week and a half of camp coming up here. I, I think he's got a much better shot than maybe we all thought he had come at the beginning. Now, that wasn't to say that we didn't think he had a chance. I mean, I, if you recall, I think you know Hextall mentioned him when we talked 
uh, to him over the summer um, as a guy that they're uh, that they're considering or they want to see, you know, they want to look at in camp. Um, so it's not that big of a surprise, but it's more of a surprise that it's three C and not four C, um, which was which very well could be where he ends up. Uh, the thing of it is, is that it's you know the Flyers are going are, are facing a real interesting situation here because. This is a time of year where you know, and, and this is when I'm gonna I'm gonna actually side with you for once, Russ, because yeah. I know that we, I know we always argue about this, but I I think that this is a, a situation where guys like Vorobiev and Nick Kubel, who's actually looked pretty good in camp as well, and in, in so far um, uh, in, the, in the preseason games, um, they deserve a shot to be you know amongst the 13 forwards that are gonna make this team rather than Yuri Laterra or Dale Weiss, who the Flyers could just as easily run through waivers. They're not going to be claimed. Nobody's going to claim them because of their contracts. And just send them the hell down to the AHL, you know? Just go down there and play down there. Do with them what they did to Matt Reed last year and just send them down. And if you need to recall them because somebody gets hurt or whatever and you don't want to call up another AHL guy who's, you know, doesn't have NHL experience and now you have guys who have a little bit of NHL experience who you could call on to come fill in for, you know, six, eight, ten games if need be, fine. Um I, I, I would rather they did that. And it, it that that possibility exists. The Flyers have, you know, the wiggle room under the cap now to be able to get creative with stuff like that. I think they'd be better off. Um you know, sending those two guys down to the Phantoms, even if they are veterans, which I know Hacksaw loves the veterans, send them down and keep these younger players up. I think you get a better lineup. You also get a point. hungrier group. You're not going to have a complacent group. It sets a tone very early. Yeah. That, well, I think it sets a, a tone very early um, that those who, you know, bust it the most in camp, the, the guys who go out and, you know, give the team the most um, – you know the best chance of of success and and winning uh, are going to be rewarded, and it's not just going to be those who may have you know put in extensive years and who at this point are just kind of you know sort of hanging on to a career. Now, all that said, Dale Weiss does have a goal uh, in the game tonight that just went final or just um, let's see, it was yes. six four. Yes. Uh, Carter Hart, by the way, people who uh, we'll talk about Carter Hart in a minute, but Carter Carter Hart uh, ended the game on a uh, it was a five on three against, and he stood on his head for the better part of the last uh, four and a half minutes of the game. So, uh, so kudos to him, but Dale Weiss had a, uh, a goal in this game tonight. So uh, let's, let's not go throw the, the man under the bus. He had a goal and an assist to go with uh, his four shots on goal. So uh, no, but I, I get what you're saying and, and I'm glad that you're finally, you know, wising up. I'm glad you're learning from me. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I, I think at some point, you know, hopefully it's, I, I'm kind of seeing some Phillies parallels here. I hate saying that, uh, but I mean this in a good way. So I, I kind of think that this year, you know, you're allowed to kind of take a, a couple risks, a couple flyers on some younger guys. Flyers, see that? That was a, not meant to be a poem, but here we are. Um, take, take a couple flyers on some of these young guys and see how they react early in the season. I know that, you know, teams a lot of times don't want to start the clock uh, on, on some of these guys or they're going to send them down almost immediately to start the year, but it doesn't hurt. It, it, it truly... I think we know what we're going to get with Dale Weiss. We know what we're going to get with Yuri Laterra. We know what we're going to get with a lot of the, the kind of fringe vets on the team. Put some hungry kids in and, and see if they, you know, embrace the moment and, you know, carpe diem and all that. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll uh, you know, surprise you. So I think that a few of these guys, you know, Vorobiev, I think, has been a surprise to this point. You know, there were some that thought he would have an outside shot to, you know, maybe break with the big camp. Um at least, you know, kind of late in, in at this point. But uh, he, I, I don't see a way that they don't have Robiev up with the big club to start the season. He's he's played that well. Now, the only thing I guess I would I would say that kind of counters that uh, is, you know, Hextall had said to us a few months ago that, you know, he's, as he makes the decision about, you know, whether a young guy should be up with the club or, you know, go back down and start the season with the Phantoms, he did say that, you know, the previous year and previous years of, uh, of service time kind of weigh in on that. You know, a guy can become a flash in the pan uh, through camp and in the preseason. But if if it's a flash in the pan and you never did any of those things in the minors, you know, they, they kind of look at that a little bit differently than maybe the fan would as an emotional human being. So I don't right. know, Vorobiev certainly looks good. No, he does. And it, so the, to to your point, 
it's easier to do this with a forward than it is with a defenseman. And I think that that's where a lot of times the fans kind of, you know, and I, fans and I kind of separate. Um, you, you can hide a young forward, you know, your 12th guy, because he's, you could play him six minutes and not kill yourself, right? Not, it's not going to hurt you. Whereas a young defenseman, you really can't. You really, you really they got to play. I mean, they got to play 12 minutes at least, if not a little bit more. And I think that that's why it's harder to sit there when, you know, last year when people were screaming for the young defenseman rather than Andrew McDonald or, you know, or Brandon Manning or Radko Gudis. Um, I, I think that it's you sit there and say it's not as easy to bring in a young defenseman and give them minutes, you know, important minutes in games. And whereas you can do it a little bit easier when it's one of 12 forwards than when it's one of six defensemen. And so I think that that's, that's the thing that needs to, that people need to take into consideration as well. And so I, while I agree that I think Vorobiev uh, probably is, is, is in the midst of earning himself a, a, a spot or at the very least a real hard, long look, um, I, I, I also think it's easier to do that with him than it would be with, say, Phil Myers, who... Oh, this uh, is beautiful. Hold on. Let me pause you there for a second. We will talk yeah. about Phil Myers after a quick word from uh, two of the sponsors on the Crossing Broad Podcast Network. And we'll start with Amerigas. <laughs> Don't forget to uh, to check out crossingbroad.com forward slash Amerigas. Uh, it is a very simple thing to do. You put in your name and your email and you'll be entered to win a uh, grill. I can't say the name of the uh, the brand. I can just say that it's probably the best brand out there for grills. Um, and it rhymes with, never mind, I'm not going to do that. Um, but the grill is valued at $499. It is a, uh, a very, a very impressive grill, we'll say. Uh, all you have to do is put in your name and email. That's it. We're going to draw a name at random. I believe hey, the contest runs through hey, September 29th. Russ, can, what? We, can I just stop you for one second? What? Who is the um, defenseman that the Flyers almost got from Nashville a few years ago. I forget his name. Oh, um, uh, was it Suter? You mean Suter? Oh, no, no. Oh, no. The, the other guy. Mm, mm, mm. Good point. Oh, Good Shea point. Weber. Yeah, Shea Weber. Oh, That's, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Like I'm, just, I'm, just yeah. I'm just forgetting I'm just forgetting who he is just for yeah. a second. Yeah, yeah. yeah I like, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I like, go back, I like, go back to I like your... Shea Weber. I, yeah. I, was, there yeah. A, was there a Shea Charbroil? No, I don't think there was. I think no, it was no, Shea no. Weber. Yeah, yeah. Shea Good Weber. Point. Yeah, so you can get... I'm sorry. You can go back to the ad. Thanks, Anthony. So uh, anyway, $499 value on this grill and, uh, you know, go out, get the tailgates going as you uh, get ready to don the orange and black for the start of the season. Or if, uh, if you're an Eagles fan or whatever, uh, you know, go out, tailgate. If you're looking to uh, burn your Phillies jerseys and also, uh, you know, get a burger going and uh, mourn the loss of, uh, you know, another baseball season like Anthony and Bob have been doing on Crossed Up for the last few weeks, uh, by all means, you know, enter to win this contest. It is, uh, it's that simple. Uh, our, the other sponsor on the Crossing Broad Podcast Network is Tropicana Sports. Uh, not the orange juice, which I do love their orange juice, but they are not a sponsor, so I'm done with the orange juice. Tropicana Sports, if you go onto the website, uh, one of the banners right along the top, they're running uh, daily contests and summer weekly contests where you can, um, it, it'll be like a random pick em. I just did it. There's a, a pick em five for baseball. They're going to be doing a pick em on uh, Thursday Night Football. As you kind of go through it, you just put in your email, you make a few picks, and you can win some prizes. Uh, it includes um, past prizes have included some meals, uh, meal vouchers for uh, restaurants at the Tropicana Resorts, as well as uh, I think one of the grand prizes was a uh, their like large suite that overlooks the uh, the ocean, and it came with like a bunch of other stuff. So. Uh, it's free. There is no sign up required. It's not like when you go on to a bunch of gambling apps and you have to like throw thirty dollars in or something, and then you're, you know, you're kind of beholden to uh, to you know wagering all thirty dollars before you can pull money out. This is not anything to do with money right now. It's just free and it's free contests, and you can go win stuff. So uh, go check out CrossingBroad.com. It's one of the top two banner ads. It's Tropicana Sports. So big thank you to them. And, of course, a big thank you to Amerigas, the nation's number one propane provider found locally at Home Depot and 7-Eleven and at thousands of locations nationally. If it ain't pro- if it ain't Amerigas, it ain't propane. Well, it might be propane, but it's not good. Amerigas is the best. The end. So Phil Myers, uh, he is fantastic. But, uh, you know, we've had we've had a bunch of questions that have come up about Phil Myers uh, over the course of the last week or two, especially with the injury to Andrew McDonald. It seemed like it opened the door to Phil Myers kind of waltzing his way in. Uh, we made note, I believe, on 
Saturday, there were a couple interesting pairings that had gone uh, uh, gone on at practice. I think we had seen, um, or or it looks like Phil Myers might end up in a pairing potentially with like a Robert Haig, while uh, Gudis, I think we saw with Sanheim, if I remember correctly. There have been some interesting pairings, but do you see Phil Myers, you know, making this team? Who is his primary competition for the uh, the final defenseman spot on this I'm not, team? I'm not convinced he's going to make the team out of camp. I'm just not. I think that, the, I mean, they, does he have a shot? Yeah, he does. Um, and McDonald's injury certainly makes that chance a little bit, you know, more likely. Um, but I still I still put it about 50-50. I really do. I think Christian Fallen, Fallen is going to get the, the number six spot, obviously. I mean, that's why they brought him in to be the number seven defenseman, basically. Um, I think that he jumps up to the number six spot. And I, I, I have a feeling that they don't want a guy like Phil Myers who needs to play more to take up a spot that's just going to be a reserve. Like if he was gar- if he was guaranteed to be playing, I don't think they would mind as much putting him on that third pair and and really kind of easing him in. Um and maybe he he does enough here over the next uh you know 3 4 preseason games to make them say, "You know what? Let's give it a shot." And and then he does make the team. But I I really think another guy who's been playing a little bit that no one's really talking about is TJ Brennan. He's got NHL experience um, with Buffalo. And uh, I think that he's a guy that you can sit there and say, all right, McDonald's going to miss eight to 10 games. TJ Brennan can be our number seven defenseman for eight to 10 games. And if we need to play him once or twice, he won't kill us. Okay. Um, he's not a great defenseman, but he's at least, you know, NHL experienced and can do it. And meanwhile, Phil Myers can still go down with the Phantoms and play 22 minutes a night and get become that better defenseman that you need him to be. Because ultimately, when he comes up here, you want him to be able to play 15, 18 minutes and, and be a, 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 a real contributor as opposed to sitting there saying, oh, geez, we can't put – got to rotate just five guys now for the last two periods because we can't have Phil Myers out there making a mistake, which is something that he does. I mean, that, you know, that's the one thing. It's Phil Myers has a lot of the same – issues now that Travis Sanheim had at the beginning of last year which was he's he's going to turn the puck over he's going to make a mistake on the wall he's not going to ha- he's going to have an error in coverage and yeah he's big and and rangy and he can kind of make up for some mistakes sometimes but the game moves at a whole different l- speed at the NHL level and i it, maybe he may not recover as quickly or as easily so i i you know i'm not going to say no that he doesn't make the team but I'm still kind of leaning more toward him going back to the Phantoms. I think he will be here till the end of camp. I think he's, you know, kind of like Sam Moran was at the beginning of last year. But I would not be surprised if he's like one of the last guys sent back down and they bring back somebody like Brennan to um, be the number seven defenseman. All right. I think that's fair. And I think that's going to be something that uh, is hopefully going to answer Eric Hoflick's question, E. Hoflick97 on Twitter who had uh, asked about McDonald and, and Myers and such. Um, Eric also asked about, you know, who we think is going to win the 3C battle between Lawton, Vorobiev, and Wheel. Um, safe to say that that probably all three of those guys make the roster. I, you know, kind of going back to the previous conversation, I wouldn't be surprised to see Wheel and Lawton flipping and flopping uh, throughout the season until they kind of find a rotation that, that works best. But I think, you know, part of this, of course, is part of that trickle down of, Sean Couturier, how he looks. Of course, Nolan Patrick's going to be your, your 2C. So, I don't know. We'll kind of see how this thing plays out. If Couturier tweaks something uh, before the start of the season, then all bets are off. But I think as of right now, you know, that could very well be, I don't know, if if, if they're impressed with how Lawton finished this game off today, then maybe they consider bumping him up to the 3C. I don't know. I hope. Yeah. I like Lawton. I, I like Lawton a lot. I think, I think he can give more to this team than that maybe they've thought um, they would want to rely on him for. So, I don't know. I'm a big big Lawton believer. <laughs> I'm a Lawton well, truther, I guess. Is that someone I'm going to be? Like, this might be the hill that I die on this year, is that Scott Lawton could uh, could far exceed expectations. I don't know. Just think the guy's got his head on the right way. <laughs> yeah, he's, he he does. And and another interesting thing about Lawton, we, we kind of got away from it for a second, you know, because we did talk to him for – you know, a good amount of time after practice. And he was kind enough to, he had just done like two other interviews and was heading off uh, to the shower and I stopped him. 
and, and he, he was to... clothed. Let's yeah. just be clear. Yeah, and he, Anthony we... didn't just like grab a naked athlete. He did. <laughs> he did catch the guy while still in. Uh, but in I saw. I, but he gave us. He gave. You know, he, he, he's a good guy, and he gave us some time. And um, we talked about the penalty kill as well, and and, and how that's changed. And an interesting thing with the PK is that Lawton said that you know the beginning of last year. Um, they were too aggressive, and that's why they were getting beat. And then he said, then they, ch- you know, uh, they made changes to the PK, and they got a lot more conservative, and they were still getting beat. And he said that the ultimate thing, the one thing that they really didn't do was find like a middle ground, and that's kind of where they are now. And so basically, what he was, the way he was explaining it, without getting into you know real, real specifics, is that. The, everybody's going to play their position. They can't keep trying to cover for each other or play do somebody else's job or, or take up somebody else's responsibility. Each of the four guys on the ice is going to have a responsibility, and they have to stick to that. It's, it's a very disciplined ideology. And because if you don't have players who are skilled enough to, you know, improvise a little bit or cover for an, a teammate who's getting a little bit, you know, somebody's trying to make a play, and and you know you have to cover for them. Um, they may not have this the the speed on the PK to, to do that, or the or the skill to do that on the back end. But they do when they do play their positions the way they're supposed to be played. They are relatively solid uh, in that regard. So I think that the goal is ultimately to just, and it seems so simple, but it's ultimately just to do their job. And if they just do their job individually, then the team penalty kill should improve. And that's kind of Ian LaPerriere's goal this year. Um, Scott Lawton got pulled off of the penalty kill last year, because, and he admitted it. He said he was not very good um, on the PK. But now he's going to be asked to give it another go. And I think you're going to see a lot more of Lawton on the penalty kill. And I think you're going to see a, a different kind of approach uh, than what they had last year. And, um, you know, I, I, yeah, there's only you can there's nowhere to go but up. I mean, they were <laughs> they were what next to last in the PK in the NHL or third from last. I mean, they were right at the bottom. Um, so can't really get much worse. So it can only improve. Um, and, and, and I'm glad that they spent a lot of time in the offseason kind of looking at it and working on it and thinking about a better way to to uh, approach it. And. Um, from talking to Scotty, it, it's really seems like it's like it was a it was like Ian LaPerriere's pet project this summer. Like this is we're going to figure this damn thing out, um, and so we'll see we'll see how it turns out. Um, you know, can't, I can't I don't use preseason as a per- barometer. I don't care if they gave up a lot of goals. I don't care if they stopped every power play the other teams had. We'll wait and see till October fifth when the season opens in Vegas, and. Uh, see how it looks then and then we'll have a much better idea um if the adjustments that they are making this summer are, are going to ultimately work out yeah for the record the uh <laughs> flyers uh ranked 29th in the nhl last season with a yeah, uh, 70 75.8 percent yeah. penalty kill percentage so that's uh certainly not good um okay a couple other questions from twitter uh most of them well here's one has Torinsky made enough of an impression to make the flyers uh, let's start there. No, um, I think he's made an impression. I think he's made enough of an impression that he's on the depth chart, like down the depth chart a bit. Um, but he's going to assist tonight. Yeah, he's going to go back to the Phantoms, and, and 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 that's okay. I mean, and I think that it's a good thing. I mean, I think that they look at him ultimately as a guy who could be a bottom six player um, on this team, uh, just not right now. Uh, I think he needs he needs a little bit of time. You don't just jump from. Uh, the NCAA and, and right into right into the NHL very often unless you're a, you know a real 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 talented player um, and, and I don't I, I think that he's I think he's on the list like I mean I think he's I think he's been impressive um, in training camp um, but I think that uh, uh, they need to he needs to show that he you know he can turn this into a first year in the in the AHL. Um, and uh, and have a good year down there before he's really considered at the NHL level. All right, so second question uh, in here uh, by Joe Plaza was, uh, any chance 
that Lyon has shown enough to beat out Neuwirth for the backup job. I th- I thought that there was a possibility that he would end up being the backup this year, um, more so because I thought the Flyers would look to move Neuver. Uh, but the, I don't know if you you know if you saw this, uh, Alex Lyon was slated to start this game tonight and uh, actually took warmups. Um, and then had uh, some kind of lower body injury and was scratched. And Stolarz, um, or not tonight, la- last night's game uh, on the island, and um, was supposed to start the game and then was scratched, and Anthony Stolarz played the entire game. Um, so, uh, you know, you got to wonder what that situation is as well. And, you know, if he's going to be a little dinged up to start the season – then I think that uh, it's probably unlikely that Alex Lyon makes the team as the backup. Okay. Uh, Let's move on to another one. Uh, There were two or three people who asked how Carter Hart looks. Um, You know, like I mentioned, at at the end of the game, well, I I guess let's kind of go overall in this game. Uh, Carter Hart, I believe, tonight faced two five-on-threes for an extended period of time and uh, came out relatively unscathed in the aftermath of the game. Uh, 22 saves on 23 shots, uh, including, like I said, that that four and a half ish minute flurry to end the game uh, with five on three um, and power play against. So I, I think he's acquitted himself pretty well. He's still, you know, uh, last night's game, he was giving up some pretty juicy rebounds. Um, but, you know, ultimately, he's a 20 year old kid who, you know, I think a lot of fans have been clamoring for. And I, I still think it's too early for him to be up. You know, will he get a call up at some point this season. Um, probably not. I, I wouldn't expect it unless we've hit, um, you know, a moment where the flyers make a trade of say an Alex Lyon or an Anthony Solars or a, a Michael Neuver. There may be maybe multiple of those guys or we're hit with a, a massive injury rash, which, you know, isn't out of the realm of possibility here. Um, but I, I, I don't the way that he gets called up to the big club. His only shot I think would have been for him to play out of his mind throughout this preseason, throughout camp, and, and really kind of force Hextall's hand. I just don't see it right now. But, you know, when he comes up next year and he's 21, I, th- I think next year could be the year for him. Yeah, he actually let in two goals tonight. Um, he played two periods. Um, uh, did have 25, oh. 25 saves. You um, sure about that? I'm looking at this. It says Elliot, Elliot gave up three. No, Hart gave Elliot, up one. Play, Elliot played one period, gave up two. Uh, Carter Hart played the second period and the third period and gave up two. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'm looking at it right here. And Elliot gets credit for the win, which is kind of funny because the Flyers were ahead and never never relinquished the lead. But Elliot faced 13 shots, 11 saves. Carter Hart faced 27 shots, 25 saves. So that's a, I mean, it's still, that's a, it's a, that's a good two periods. I mean, you only, you know, you're only letting up two goals. Um, uh, and you know, like you said, two five one threes that he faced and you know, he was making some big saves, especially at the end of the game there. Um, so yeah, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a good showing, but people need to just relax. He's not NHL ready. He's just not, I I don't know how much more I can say it more matter of factly. He needs to play. I, I would say conservatively, he needs to play the full season in the AHL. If I'm going to be a little bit liberal about it, I could say, okay, maybe if he's like really dominant in the AHL, he can come up, you know, February or March. But geez, I, I don't see that happening either. I, I really think that he's he's spending the whole year with the Phantoms. Just get used to it. It's okay. It, you could get excited for him down the road. He's not ready yet. Um, he's just just not. Uh, and uh, let, let's just let's just take it easy here. Preseason hockey is not real hockey. And you got that's also got to be kept in mind. There's a lot of guys playing in these games who are not NHL players. So when your goalie is making 25 saves in two periods and you're like, "Oh my god, look at him. He's going to be the he's going to be a stud." He well could be, but don't base it off of watching one game in the preseason because you're going up against, you know, 12 of the 20 players who aren't going to be on that roster. <laughs> So um, let's let's keep that in perspective, and uh, don't worry about it. Carter Hart's going to be brought along properly. They're not going to sit there and slow play it. He's gonna he's gonna get his chance when he's ready, and he's not ready yet, and that's and that's okay. I like uh, Frank Barber on Twitter asks, uh, 
What are the chances Carter Hart makes the roster and Heck just leaves him in the press box? That's it. Stop. That's, it. that's, that's, that's Stop. so bad. That's not bad. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, I had also asked for you know comments, and uh, Clemson Delphia on Twitter said, very impressed by Lindblom and Vorobiev. Uh, we already talked about Vorobiev. Lindblom looks like he's he's kind of found his stride. Looks like the game is no longer too fast for him. Um, had a good showing tonight, a couple of goals uh, and an assist. He's looking good, um, and he's he's contributing. And, you know, uh, I think after the way that things kind of played out for him last season, there were certainly moments that it looked like, you know, maybe he wasn't quite ready for the speed of the NHL. And obviously the preseason here is not quite... <laughs> Not quite at the level of uh, the regular season, to say the least. But he's acquitted himself well to this point, and you know he certainly looks like a, a sure thing to make the roster. I think so. I think uh, I think he makes it for sure. Um, I, I I just don't I don't see him being with what I think a lot of fans think he's going to be. That's the one thing I think that they think he's going to be. A, I think they believe Lindblom's going to be a better scorer than he's going to be. I think he's going to I think he's going to be a 30 point a season guy and you're happy with that. You know, and he's going to he's going to play third line wing. He's a good two-way forward. He's responsible defensively. You'll you'll take that. Um he's one of those guys who's going to be, hey, if we need to bump somebody up for a few games to play on a higher line, we can throw Lindblom up there. Um kind of thing if the if there's a, a need on left wing. But he's going to be a he's going to be a third line winger, and he's going to get some you know important minutes, and you know I think he's going to be a good player, but I don't think he's going to be more than what he is, and I worry that because the buzz has been so you know big about him, that I'm worried that he the people are going to be disappointed, and and I don't think that that's fair because I think that he's I think that he is what he is, and I think he could be a good player in this league without being a you know a secondary point produ- a second line kind of point producer. And I think that people think that that's what he's going to be, and I, it's he's just not. If he turns out to be that, great. That's that's bonus. But I don't think the Flyers look at him and say, "Oh, that's what we anticipate. We anticipate him being a you know top six forward." He's not. He's just not, and. Um, so I mean I think if he if he ends up being a good third line winger, great. And that's what he should be. And if you get the if you get the extra, that's that's something that was unexpected. Uh I want to get back to so um Darren on Twitter had asked about who we think the uh defensive pairings are gonna be. Um I, I kinda wanna approach this in a maybe like next week's episode after we get a little bit of a better feel. I think for right now, though, we can probably assume that anybody who has any kind of offensive skill set, um, Travis Anheim kind of pops to mind, is probably going to be paired with somebody who's uh, maybe not as fleet of foot, who might be a little bit more responsible in defensive coverages, right? Like, I, I'm assuming that's how how uh, Hack is going to play this. I would also assume that Provi and Ghost are going to be split up to start the season. I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, he, they were split up in, in last weekend when we were there, but... <sighs> They may actually put them together. I mean, a lot will depend on how everybody else looks. I mean, I think Sanheim's going to probably ultimately play with Gudis. It's my guess, or maybe even maybe even McDonald when he comes back, probably. And then you have you know, I don't know if Gudis and Haig is a good combination. I, I think Sanheim and Gudis would probably be better, and then Haig with McDonald, and then obviously Pro, um, Provorov and Gostaspare. But until McDonald comes back, I mean, the you know, wh- where does Christian Folan fit in? I think he's a third Somewhere pair in the press guy. Box with us, I don't know. <laughs> no, I think he's in the third. I think he's a third pair guy when he's while he's playing. And then the question is, well, how do the, how do you juggle it around? And that's why I think it's possible that you might see Provorov and Gossis Bear separated, but only short term, um, just so that they have better balance. Uh, but I don't. I, I can't say that with 100% certain. Like, we saw Gostas Bear with Haig, right, when yep. we were there on Saturday. Yep. And that's not a surprise because they did play together um, last year, actually started the season together last year, played really well together. Then they took Gostas Bear off of that second pairing and put him with Provorov, 
And he never went back to being paired with Haig until toward the end of the season. They played, I don't know, three or four or five games together again. And then they split them back up again. But now that they're partnered up again, granted it was just for the afternoon session of a Saturday, second the second day of training camp kind of thing. Um, I, I think it's something that's a possibility with McDonald out of the lineup that you see them try and spread it around a little bit more. And I wouldn't be surprised if you if you see Sanheim playing with Provorov. I I really wouldn't. Um, not to say that that's that's going to happen either, but it, that's the kind of thing that's kind of cre- like that's a creative way of doing it and spreading your spreading your um, your your skating defenseman and your more skilled defenseman out until you get you know McDonald back. And I know people don't think he's reliable, but he is reliable. Um, until he's back, I think it would. You, I would not be surprised to see them spread it around. But if they need, if they're behind in a game or whatever, and then the third period, you put Gostas Bear and Provorov on the ice at the same time and hope that they can generate offense for you. All right, last question from Twitter before we go to uh, our final segment. Uh, it comes from Chris Kringle, 1977, who says, uh, Vorobiev was a fourth-round pick, Myers an undrafted free agent. Hextall isn't just succeeding with first-rounders but also late-round picks. Did he revamp the scouting, or does he have a better eye for talent than Holmgren? He neither. Um, I, I think there's a third answer here, but I, I think so. First, you should know that the Flyer scouting staff currently is not much different, with other than you know a couple guys here or there. It's really the, their primary scouts are the same guys that were primary scouts when Paul Holmgren was GM, and it's not like Hextall's sitting there, and, you know overruling the scouts and saying, well, here's who I like, and this is what I'm drafting. Um, it's not really how it works. They actually have extensive meetings, and, and I could I could say this because I was embedded in there for one, for one uh, draft with, the, with, these, with this group of guys. And they sit around, and they literally – I mean, they have guys broken off into groups, um, and, and it's like, okay, here's who we expect to go in this section of the draft. Here's who we expect to go in this section – and they really kind of break it down, and then they, they rank their guys within these tiers, within these little tiers. And, you know, they talk about them at length and say, well, why, do we, why would we like this guy maybe a little bit more than this guy or vice versa? Um, and, and that's how it's done, and it's a whole group effort. And, yeah, of course, Hextall being the GM and Holmgren when I was there, um, yeah, they, they are the, you know, final say – but they're going to rely on their scouts because the scouts have seen these guys a lot more than they have. And, and so ultimately, they're going to rely on their scouts. So the scouting, the scouting hasn't changed. Um, and no, so I, I don't want to sit there and say, oh, well, that, you know, they're doing better, you know, better now than they were then. I mean, Paul Holmgren did pretty good. If you go back and look at his drafts, he actually did pretty well in his drafts. You know, the guys that he picked had made it to the NHL and, and had good careers in the NHL. So um, you can't take anything away from Paul's drafts as well. I think the difference is, is twofold. One, the Flyers have more draft picks now than they ever did because they were for years and years and years. They traded away draft picks. Um and, and and that was the reason why they were able to get, you know always bring in a player because they would they didn't they didn't care draft picks take them we'll 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 trade for what we need um, and so they used those assets to to acquire current NHL players as opposed to future NHL players so maybe it seemed like there was less hits outside of the first round um, because they weren't because they were trading those picks away but secondly I think that there's and this might might be more um, uh, the reasoning and more of the answer. Um, I, I think that the the style of player um, is different now, and the Flyers are drafting a different style of player, um, and that's because they're trying. They've you know Hextall has, has really made a a, a a push and an effort to build this team in the new NHL and not try and force the square peg into the round hole. Um, of what it used to be in the NHL. So whereas the Flyers used to try and get big centers down the middle um, because big centers were the way to go in the NHL for a long, 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 long time, um, now they're going for guys who can skate 
and uh, are a little bit they maybe they might be smaller they might be you know uh, they're certainly faster um, they may not be as strong but they're certainly going to you know be able to skate circles around you and have a lot more skill and the like and so I think that that's what the game is and so I think that that's the, those are the kinds of players that have been drafted since Hextall got here so I think that there if there was a philosophical change it was hold on to more draft picks so we have a better chance of hitting uh, on on a pick and secondly draft a different style of player um, and I think that that's why you you know there, there's a feeling that they might be getting more uh, successes um, but they're also not going out and doing the things it, if you want to sit there and say yeah he's doing a better job than, than Holmgren there okay fine you can say that but you know who is Hextall bringing in from in free agency and trading for I mean, other than JVR, which we still don't know, I mean, how that's going to pan out, but it's probably going to be a, a, a win um, in, in the sense that he's going to put up points. Really, who is Hextall brought in that you sit there and say, oh, that was a great signing or that was a good trade? I, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, where, who are those guys? And so, so, therefore, you could sit there and say, well, okay, he's doing better on the back end, but he's really not doing as well on the front end, but that's because it's a philosophical change on how to build a team. Um, that's all. I, and I, and I think so. I, you know, I, I don't take anything away from Holmgren, the Holmgren era, as far as drafting. Um, I just think that Hex, Hexel has a slightly different philosophy to get to the same point. That was the most, uh, long winded answer to, uh, tell somebody that neither of their, their options were an appropriate one, but that was good. I like it. Oh, you want, it was you, want, you, want you know what? Hey, you can go edit it if you want. No, I refuse. I think it was good. I liked it. I appreciated it. <laughs> All right, isn't so that why people is that why people listen to this podcast for insight? Yes, indeed it is. You know, speaking of insight and what people think, Anthony, uh, we're going to bookend our final segment with uh, two iTunes reviews. We have two five star reviews, Anthony. We do have a one star review, which means you know what that means, Anthony. Do you know what, what does it do you mean? You know what that means? When somebody leaves a one star review, that means I go digging into their uh, their old reviews. So somebody had left a one star review, so I went to just click on it really quick because they they seem to be uh, a, a little bit frustrated. I think. Mostly with the episode that we did on the uh, state of sports journalism, they got really, really upset. And they also didn't like that I call this the Only Flyers podcast, like very upset about it. So they gave a one star review. So I clicked on it just to see like, oh, okay, this person probably reviews a lot of stuff. Nope, it was just for us. Uh, I don't know. We call that fake news. I think it's fake news. So we're going to move on to our two five star reviews and we'll do one right now. One is by uh, Johnny O, who has previously left a, uh, an iTunes review. So that's good. Uh, Johnny O, best info, five stars. Clearly the most knowledgeable and connected Flyers podcast out there. Anthony combines his insider knowledge and history with the team for a fair analysis of where the organization is heading. Russ does a good job asking the right questions and bringing out more of a fan view. The sports journalism slash critique of certain commentators episode was fantastic and eye-opening. Also, there was an episode where Anthony talked about the culture changes and the or- about around the organization since Snyder. Listen to those first. Looking forward to the season. Thank you, Johnny O. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, yeah, I like having the uh, fan perspective, although although things are changing. Things are brewing. I can't just be a fan anymore. I actually have to be objective if I'm going to be up in a press box. <laughs> God help us. This is... Uh, how long will I get to keep a credential? How long do you think it's going to last? Well, let's see. Let's, here's, here's how I look at it, right? Okay. So you are now officially the third person in the history of Crossing Broad to have a credential. Love it. Okay. Love it. The first guy lasted what? One game? Yeah. And then they revoked his credential mm-hmm. after he wrote some jackassery on the on the website. Uh, the second guy is me, who I don't I don't think my credential is being revoked anytime soon. Um, and then you're the third. Hey buddy. So all you need to do is last longer than one game and you're the second most tenured guy ever for crossing broad <laughs> flyers games <laughs> setting the bar incredibly high the crossing broadway <laughs> yes uh, i uh i'm looking forward to uh to causing some mayhem and when i say causing mayhem i mean like respectfully standing in the box uh not getting in the way and just being polite to people because that's what i do yeah, and, also, and also were... inciting some riots along the way. No, you were fans. good. You were good the other night, uh, the other day over at training camp. I thought you handled yourself well. I'm, I'm polite. I smile at people. I think it it uh, it throws people off. I think people are nice to you know 
people being genuinely kind to them. It's a really, yeah. really weird thing. Apparently, it doesn't happen much in this world. So uh, I don't know. I'm a rare yeah. breed, I guess. I don't know. Uh, all right. So Anthony, this leads us to our uh, our newest edition of Who's That Flyer? Oh boy. Uh, I I wanted to keep this one easy. I did for a second almost go with a a player that I think there is no chance, and I mean when I say no chance, I mean absolutely no chance of you getting. Um, it's a guy who is currently 38 years old and is playing in some obscure league I've never heard of before. Uh, do you want me to tell you who that guy was? Or you can or you can make it the who's that flyer? Dude, I really have no idea how I would even do this. He spent most of his career in the AHL. I think he has five NHL seasons under his belt, uh, like a seven-game stint, a six-game stint, 18, 35, and one game. The last time he played in the NHL, he played for the Anaheim Mighty Ducks in 2005-2006. He played for the Flyers uh, in 2001-2002 and got a call up in 2002-2003. A total of 13 games, uh, no points. He had uh, two total penalty minutes in both of those stints, a plus-minus of four and minus one. Uh, I don't think you're going to be able to name that Flyer. Uh, he did most recently play for the, uh, is this the, the Thetford Asurancia in the LNAH? I don't think you're going to know this flyer, Anthony. He has played for Ingolstadt and Straubing Tigers in the, uh, is that the, the Deutsches, yeah, Deutsches Liga. Uh, a lot of years in the AHL. You just, you just like to, sp- you just like to speak in uh, German. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Any idea who that flyer is? <sighs> this isn't fair. I, you know, <sighs> Five seasons, and he ended up going to Anaheim after the Flyers? Yes. He played one game for the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. All right. I'm going to ask you for one more clue. Okay. I'm going to ask you for one more clue. Um, Where did he play junior hockey? Uh, He played in the QMJHL for... By Kamel Drakar. If I tell you that I think I know who the answer is, would you be stunned? Not only would I be stunned, Anthony, I would know that you had to have Googled it. No. But I honestly don't know how you could have Googled this because this guy is so obscure. Yeah. I Well, so here's the thing. And I and this is, what, this is what I'll say to you. Because when I first covered the team and I first covered the team... Uh, in the 2000-2001 season, oh I God, made it. A, it. I it. made it a point no. to like study no. like the history of the of every player who was in the organization. And so when you when you give me by Como, it really knocks down um, the the options here. And I I really don't remember this. Is why it's, I think it's a guess because I don't remember this guy going to Anaheim. I kind of remember him going from the Flyers to Carolina. Um, oh yeah, he I, did. Yeah, I, I left that part out. Yeah. Yeah, I he think did. I think he was the I think he was traded for Sammy Kapanen. Oh my god. Am I right about this? Uh, uh, <laughs> am I right? I don't know. Uh, oh wait, show I, trades. I think, Hold on, I can find it. Hold on. Yes. Damn. Yes, you're right. Yes, he was traded for Sammy <laughs> is, it, is, is it Bruno? <laughs> is Br- it Bruno San Jacques? It is Bruno San Jacques. I don't know how you did that, Anthony. This is the most impressive <laughs> edition of Who's That Flyer I have ever experienced. I legitimately well, looked at the 2001 2002 t- team and said, Who's the most obscure person I can find? <laughs> he played seven games in the 2001 2002 season for the Flyers. No points. None. Yeah. I yeah. I am simply stunned. He barely played for the Flyers, but he did play a lot for the Phantoms. He did. He yeah. Play, yeah, 45 games in 2000, 2001, 55 and 01, 02, 30 and 02, 03. Uh, that was it. That was his contribution to the team. He played as recently as last season, by the way. Wow, that's, he's, that's he's, crazy. He's 38. So, so keep that in uh, mind. The, reason, the reason I know, uh, and again, here's another thing. So the year I covered the Phantoms, which wasn't until 04, 05, and he, I believe he was already gone by that point, if I'm, yeah. What I year? think he was already, 04, 05 was yeah, the year was, I covered the gone. Phantoms. Um, I think he was, I'm pretty sure he was already gone. But when he played with the Phantoms, he was a defensive partner of John Slaney. 
And I did so many, you know, interviews and conversations with Slane's back then that year. Um, and Slaney's now a coach, as a matter of fact. Um, and we would just talk a lot about about the sport. And, I, you know, I credit, to be honest with you, I credit John Slaney uh, for teaching me a lot about how the game um, – how the game is uh, uh, is was pl- was played in, in in a lot of ways. Like I mean, I knew it as a fan, but I didn't really you know know the ins and outs. And uh, John Stevens and John Slaney were really the two guys who kind of you know Hitchcock too. I mean you know on, uh, on the NHL level, but the year I covered the Phantoms, um, Stevens and Slaney were really kind of the guys who would teach me a lot about uh, about systems and and the way games were played. And we I remember talking to Slaney a lot that year, and he would always talk about. You know, game, he had like this steel trap memory of always knowing about you know game situations from previous seasons, and I remember him telling me a lot of stories about game situations that he was in with Bruno San Jacques as his partner, and so that's why when you you, you gave me that, and I'm like, I, this this could well be, and I'm thinking of obscure players from that from that era, and as soon as you. Uh, as soon as you threw a couple of things out there, and like I said, I, I need to know because I mean there were a couple other potential options I was thinking about, but uh, yeah, I, that that was the only reason I knew it. I mean, it, I don't want to sit here and sound like a, an idiot savant, but um, yeah, there it, it just was lucky that that was that was the connection. I don't even know how to respond after that. I'm, <laughs> I don't I'm, have a good. I'm legitimately Bur- stunned. All I don't right, have a good Bruno you know San Jacques story gonna, either. I'm just. Just gonna go to our other five star review now because I feel like it's the only thing we could do. <laughs> uh, I, so anyway, uh, and just so you know that L N A H that yeah. you were talking about, um, that it's a it's a league in in Quebec, and it's basically it's it's a garage league is what I call it. It's it's a combination of some former pros and some guys who just can't play hockey. Oh my god, is it the big 3? It's the big 3 of uh and, Yeah. Oh my god. Of, but but it's really <laughs> Does Ice Cube what, also fund it? No. That'd be, <laughs> one that'd of the be awesome. one of the things uh, about it is Ice Cube. Well, this takes us back to I believe was our first who's that flyer or maybe the second. Um Donald Brashear played in this league. I love Donald. And I remember talking to him once about that league like, "Hey, what's that?" He's like, "Oh, all they want me to do is go up there and fight." He's like, that's all they, it's the only reason I'm there. They don't care that I play hockey. They just want me to fight. And so that's, it, he says, it's the crowds go crazy. It's kind of like a wrestling crowd. Yes. Um, oh, we got to so. go. This is a road trip if I've ever heard one. <laughs> we can like so, expense it to Crossing Broad. This would be great. Yeah, just go up to one roam around. One of the Flyers play the Canadians. Just in, roam around Quebec. Eat poutine. I got it. Yeah. We're, we're good. <laughs> we're going to contact yeah. Jeff and Mike. We're going to get this thing funded. This there you go. Go, go on a road trip to Quebec and then check out the uh, the LNAH. <laughs> Absolument. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Yeah. All right. I'll flex some French for you. S card. So there you go. Good. Yeah. All right. Uh, Five star review. The Only Flyers podcast by Humongous Big. I'm going to keep this short. Snow the Goalie is the best Flyers podcast out there. Period. End of story. BSH used to be my go to, but the constant screaming and minimal insight led me to look for an alternative. And boy, am I glad I found this show. The Hextall interview pulled me in. Then I went back and listened to Sanheim and most recently Lion. I have to think the show will continue to pull in big guests and deliver some insight that only someone as solid as ASF, Anthony Sanfilippo, can provide. Well done, gents. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Humongous Big. That review was so Humongous Big. Yeah, I like it. That's That's good. That's nice. Thanks for the five-star reviews. Uh, Of course, we love the five-star reviews. We prefer them. The five-star ratings are great, but if you can leave us a little note about why you love the show so much, that's also swell. Uh, If you hate the show, leave a five-star review and we'll read it. So that's that's one little caveat to this. Five-star reviews, they're good. They help us get noticed. Uh, They help us climb the the ever-important rankings. And, uh, you know, go do that on iTunes. Uh, If you don't have an iPhone... Uh, go on to some computer that has iTunes. If you don't have a computer with iTunes, go find somebody who does and leave a review there. That'd be swell. Much appreciated. Of course, go check out the other shows on Crossing Broad Podcast Network as well, including Crossing Broadcast, which, by the way, Anthony, has recorded twice this week and will be recording again. 
uh, either Thursday night or Friday morning, which will give us three shows in a week for the first time since uh, the Eagles won the Super Bowl. I'm pretty sure it's it's been a long time. Uh, so uh, go check out Crossing Broadcast. Of course, go check out Crossed Up, a Phillies podcast with Anthony and Bob, who you can find on Twitter at BW Crossing Broad uh, as they begin the uh, the eulogy for the uh, Phillies season. It's not over yet, but it's, it's effectively over. Uh, go check out that show and leave them reviews and, and all that. Uh, Also, go check out It's Always Soccer in Philadelphia with Kevin Kincaid, who you can find on Twitter at Kevin underscore Kincaid. Uh, Kevin, interestingly enough, we had him on Crossing Broadcast, and he was detailing a little bit of a spat that happened between him him and another beat writer uh, for a line of questioning. The person remained anonymous, but the uh, the story was uh, ever as juicy as it could get. Which kind of had me thinking: Is there? Is there? You know what? what? I got. I got to be honest with you. But I I was a little disappointed that they kept the person anonymous. It was. uh, It was his call, and I. I understand, and I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sit here and dime the guy out. I mean, I know who it is, but I'm. I just think that it was worth pointing out because when I listened to the audio, the the anonymous person was so in the wrong. So completely and utterly in the wrong and an example of exactly what I talked about when we had my the episode where I bitched and complained about the local sports media uh, the way it is anymore. It was a, there was a gross example of just what I was talking about. To rehash it, it really it, quickly for those who might have missed it. So Kevin was at the uh, the media breakfast with uh, Sixers coach Brett Brown. He asked a question. I guess it was like an hour 40 into a two hour breakfast. Uh, he finally asked a question about, you know, the media and about all the media availability because Kevin had been, you know, a reporter on the beat for the Philadelphia Union for a long time and and the availability there just isn't nearly the same. Um, And Brett Brown began like a a really candid answer, you know, saying that it's a lot of time to be meeting with the media and, you know, it's his least favorite part of the job, not because he doesn't like the people, but just because it takes him away from, you know, doing coaching things like, you know, film and practice and other meaningful things. And you think about it in the grand scheme of things, like having a guy, you know, morning shoot around pregame, postgame, and then like another one, you know, later at night or, you know, the next day at, at shoot around again, that just seems excessive. Um, and so Kevin asked if it was fair for, you know, um, if the media had been fair to him and fair to the team and, you know, what could they do better, you know, to make it a, a little bit more tenable for, for the upcoming season. And another reporter kind of jumped in and got really upset because Kevin had mentioned that there was a quote about star hunting or star developing and how some people had misquoted him. And was that one of the ones that upset him? This person jumped in. And, and I said on, on Crossing Broadcast, if you go and you just Google um, Brett Brown star hunting and pop in the different names of the beat writers, you'll be able to figure out pretty quickly uh, who it was that you know was, I think, pretty in the wrong for uh, misquoting Brett Brown. Uh, anyway, the person jumped in and, and essentially like tried to call Kevin out onto the carpet, and it led to a screaming match uh, outside of the uh, the facility. It was a whole thing, and it was really dumb because uh, the person was just really in the wrong. And uh, yeah, so yeah, completely in the wrong, and exact exactly what I was talking about a month and a month ago, a month and a half ago, whenever it was that we recorded that episode. Yep. Um, and uh, it, it's it's I'm telling you, it exists. It exists a lot. Um, and it's bad, and, and that's why it's a shame um, that our sports coverage has become what it's become. And I think that the teams have responded by, you know, being less forthright, by being more closed off, by giving out less information because it's just not enough trustworthy. There's there are trustworthy reporters out there. I'm not trying to say that there's not. There are on every beat, and there's some really good reporters on every beat. And there are still some really good reporters in traditional outlets as well. Not just I'm not just saying this, you know, say, oh, there's good reporters, but they're only at the, you know, the new media sites. No. There are some good reporters in traditional outlets as well. It, but there are there are more guys who do things like what happened with Kevin than there ever was. And it's a it's a damn shame. It's a damn shame because it's it's ruining sports journalism in this city. Yeah. Whew. Fire and fury, the Anthony San Filippo story. I like it. I think you're right. <laughs> yeah, but thanks. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to uh, to some uh, beat writer wars this year down at uh, Wells Fargo Center. Nah, I get along with not with us. No, not with us. Not with us. Yeah. We're gonna be polite and kind and. Approach people and let them know about the Only Flyers podcast because that's that's right. That's how we do it, you know. All right, uh, 
for Anthony, who you can find on Twitter, of course, at Ant San Philly. I'm Russ at Joy on Broad. And uh, we look forward to uh, the season as it's coming up. We're going to be down at practice on what, Saturday? Yeah, we'll be there Saturday. uh, We might be going to the preseason game on Monday. We're still figuring that out. So if you're going to be down at Wells Fargo Center on uh, on Monday and you're really over the top interested in uh, in finding Anthony and uh, and me, let us know on Twitter and and maybe we'll figure that out because we like to meet the people. Right, Anthony? Absolutely. I'm a man of the people. We are the uh, the people's podcast. I think that's a good way to put it. Well, the, maybe that should be the new moniker. That should be the new. That's the, the new moniker. Podcast. Yeah, we got we got a we got a we got a negative review for the only you, flyers for podcast. the only flyers podcast. And and since we know that there are others out there, um, are there? And yeah, there are. I haven't yeah, been introduced to any of them. Yeah, no, they're out are there. there? Um, yeah. So if that's the case, and all right, fine. You know, maybe maybe that's a little bit misleading. So, but maybe we'll call ourselves the People's Podcast. The People's Podcast. I think we're also the Players Podcast. I think over the course of the season, people are going to hear that. Uh, I think the players are gonna and enjoy being on our show, and uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna do some good things this year. Very much yeah, looking forward fun. to it. So the players yeah. podcast, the people's podcast, the only Flyers podcast. Uh, for Anthony, I'm Russ. We'll talk to you again next week.